Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Concordia Africa Initiative's strategic dialogue on leadership in global digital health, a call to action. A big welcome to all our esteemed guests today. And, and above all, a very special thanks to Leah Tedese, Minister of Health for the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedese, for joining us. I'd also like to welcome Mike Froman, Vice Chairman and President, Dr. Saban Sansimana, Director General of the Rwanda Biomedical Center, Nigeria Sambuli, Co-Chair of Transform Health, Elizabeth Medu Badang, Senior Vice President, Middle East and Africa at Orange, Dr. Ahmad Uma, Deputy Director of Africa CDC, and Dr. Greg Moore, Corporate Vice President at Microsoft. Well, we have a fantastic group of speakers here today, spanning the world of government leadership, technology, the, the technical aspects of epidemiology, to talk about how digital innovation can spur our progress, not just in the fight against COVID-19, improving global health. Obviously, this week, and encouraging news with the announcements of the Pfizer-BioNTech and then Moderna vaccine performance figures. And that is, we needed some good news as a global health community after months and months of battling against this extraordinarily formidable adversary that is COVID-19. I don't think any of us should underestimate what a phenomenal strategic technical and scientific achievement it has been to go from a standing start to a vaccine of it to work pretty well in 300 days. I mean, that in the history of vaccines, we have seen nothing remotely like this. That achievement, we also need to be very realistic. We are a long way to beating this epidemic. And if we do not work extremely hard, a lot of people are still going to die before we beat this epidemic. So vaccines like the ones we've seen the announcements about, and this is assuming that all the technical data when it's evaluated confirms that they are effective and safe. Well, scaling up and rolling these things out is a bigger vaccine medical deployment task than has ever been done in the world before. And given the scale of it and the complexity of distributing, for example, they'd be kept at minus 80 degrees centigrade, given those logistical constraints and the manufacturing um, capacity constraints, um, around the world, be many, many months, sadly, before everybody who needs these vaccines gets them. We have to accelerate that. We have to make it happen as efficiently as possible. But we must also continue fighting this and with the tools we have available. The current monthly death toll of COVID-19 is about 50,000 people. To put that in perspective, that is roughly the same total as HIV, TB, and malaria. Also, COVID-19 continues to wreak havoc with economies around the world. Travel, trade, tourism, all are massively um, suffering from the absolutely justified constraints on public activity, social interaction, uh, and so on. Furthermore, the knock-on impact of both COVID-19 itself and the broader social and economic disruption on other diseases is very significant. 
wearing my hat as the executive director of the Global Fund, we're obviously very focused on the knock-on impact malaria, the three biggest other infectious diseases in the world. And we, we regularly survey our, in over 100 countries, 70% of these are suffering disruption. The level from country to country and from types of program to type of program. But there's no getting away from the fact that we have been knocked backwards on the fight against HIV, on the fight against TB, and the fight against malaria. Indeed, I think in some countries, and particularly in the knock on impact of COVID 19, will be greater than the direct impact. That is, more lives will be lost due to the in than to the direct impact. So we have a fight on our hands. We have better tools, road, but we still have a huge fight on our hands, not just to fight COVID-19 in itself, but to mitigate its impact and other diseases. And that's where technology has to play and is playing a crucial role. The one of the silver linings, perhaps, of this crisis has been the way it has been a catalyst to accelerate innovation. Things that people were talking about and sort of getting around to doing and made to happen much, much faster. We've seen a massive switch to we've seen an emphasis on uh, remote delivery of medicines. We've seen fast, better gathering and analysis of data. One of the uh, ways I think about this is to compare TB and COVID-19. This year, TB and COVID-19 will rival each other disease kills more people in the world. Roughly speaking, both diseases on current run rates will kill somewhere in the region of one and a half million people, a staggering and shocking total. These two diseases are ranked almost equally in their impact on human lives. They're starkly different in so many other ways. To start with, on January the 1st, 2021, we will, in fact, enable COVID-19 deaths and get a pretty accurate of how many people died in 2020 due to COVID-19. If you try the same for tuberculosis, for TB, you will only get 2019 data. In fact, the consolidated global numbers for TB for 2020 will be published in October 2021, i.e. 10 months later. And I think this is one good example of how COVID-19, I think, can be uh, a forcing mechanism for, get us, for us to rethink some of our assumptions about how we fight other diseases. Relying on data that is 10 months old is not really a very good approach. Um, and COVID-19, the speed of data, the level of granularity, the ability to pick out local clusters or infection rates among different segments of the population, um, we need to translate that into the way we fight diseases such as HIV, TB, and malaria. And it's in this spirit that I am um, delighted that in partnership with Rockefeller, uh, the Global Fund is launching a 25 million joint investment data science catalytic fund. This will go live um, in January. And it's a really exciting uh, initiative about how we can bring to bear the best of technology 
uh, to enable and accelerate um, the impact of the interventions we make to fight infectious diseases. It's one step forward among a set of partnerships we have with many of the people on this call, which is all around this theme of how do we leverage the power of technology to make these interventions more effective. Now, on that note, it's all very well to talk about it in theory. But what I would like to do is actually talk about how one country or hear how one country has really taken a leadership in making this happen. Ethiopia has been a pioneer of many dimensions of how you build um, effective health system in a resource constrained environment. And a real cornerstone of the Ethiopian health transformation strategic plan is innovation in data-driven healthcare, building and implementing interoperable health information systems. And I know that just recently in August, Ethiopia launched a digital health innovation center, learning center in Addis. So Dr. Tedesse, as Minister for Health, um, it would be great to hear your perspective on the role of digital health from the perspective of a health minister trying to both fight COVID and drive a longer term transformation agenda for your health system. Dr. Tedesi, um, we look forward to hearing your views. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Peter Sands, uh, Director of the Global Fund, and all distinguished panelists and uh, participants of this uh, platform. It's really a great pleasure and honor uh, to join this panel today and uh, uh, share the experiences of Ethiopia in this uh, 2020 Concordia Africa Initiative, focusing on this timely topic of uh, leadership in global uh, digital health. Uh, the, the government of Ethiopia has uh, prioritized the scale up of promising and proven innovations to bring the needed transformation in healthcare services delivery. And over the years, uh, the Ministry of Health has come to realize that digital technologies provide uh, concrete opportunities to tackle uh, our health system challenges and offer the potential to enhance uh, both coverage and quality of health services. So with this in mind, uh, our Minister of Health had developed an information revolution roadmap in 2016 as one of its transformation agenda uh, as part of its past the last five-year health sector strategy. And this aspires to bring a fundamental cultural and behavioral change towards uh, quality, uh, the, towards the quality, the value, and the practical use of health information for evidence-informed decision-making. This is the, the core of the, trans, the information revolution strategy. And with this goal in mind, the government and uh, our partners have been making deliberate investments in digital health over the past five years with strong commitment to, pro to provide critical support for all aspects of health system, both in policy-making, management, financing, and service delivery. And with this effort, there has been key uh, uh, achievement over the past few years, and just to, make, to highlight a few of them, uh, the ministry and our regional health bureaus have successfully customized and implemented the district health information system to the HIS2 system as a national health management information system uh, platform. And currently, out of the uh, our close to 1,000 districts, 950 districts, and over uh, 4,000 health facilities are uh, regularly reporting through this DHIS2 system with an average of 92% uh, reporting rate and uh, around 80% timeliness of reporting. Uh, also, we, as, as many of you know, uh, we have a, 
a flagship program of community health workers, which is the health extension program. And a year ago, uh, we implemented the electronic community health information system, uh, developed and implemented it in uh, close to 1,250 health posts, which really helped in automating community level reporting, monitoring and performance analysis, which also brings efficiency in service delivery and timely decision. Human resources are another aspect of digitization that we have been working on and then a national human resource information system, uh, EHRS is also under development to track and maintain up-to-date information on the health workforce, including their training, qualification data, and keeping an accurate uh, count of uh, staff by profession and by facility. Uh, also, although in initial stages, we have started teleradiology services at 25 hospitals by installing the necessary telemedicine infrastructure and uh, software. Of course, ensuring uh, within these uh, uh, platforms, uh, ensuring that the information and data in the architecture can easily be shared across the health system was key. And uh, we have been trying to enable the uh, interoperability of, of these systems that are, are being in place between, for example, DHIS2 and the electronic health, uh, community health information system and uh, uh, between DHIS2 and master facility registry. And now what, uh, that I will mention the COVID-19 tracker and lab system was also one area that we are working on. And within this uh, response to the, COVID, the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it has been also an, uh, as much as it's a challenge, it has been an opportunity to practically see the critical role of timely data to help our strategic decisions of the response, which was also one of our challenges within this response. And to mitigate this, uh, the DHIS2 uh, was integrated. Uh, we had developed a COVID-19 surveillance system and integrated it into the DHIS2 system uh, with collaborative efforts of the ministry and partners and other sectors outside of the Minister of Health like Innovation and Technology Ministry and have, start, have started the implementation to enable uh, the, uh, the uh, digitization of the case management, the lab management and tracing of uh, uh, patients and contacts as well. But so this has been really an opportunity to move forward in, in many of the digital uh, efforts within this pandemic. And there have been of course, multiple factors that have helped this enabling environment for successful development and implementation of uh, uh, sustainable and country-owned information systems and primarily the strong uh, political will and uh, leadership and commitment from all levels of both government and uh, having to nurture digital health champions and also commitment of respective donors and partners has really enabled this. But despite all these positive outcomes, we've had, of course, uh, different challenges while implementing this uh, re information revolution agenda. As you can imagine, bringing cultural transformation in data use is complex and requires strong, uh, it requires time and requires strong leadership and capacity building, change management and uh, behavioral change interventions, both at individual and at organizational levels. And the, Situation assessment of our last, uh, the, the implementation of our five year strategy and also our health extension uh, program assessment has shown us that there's still a limited uh, information use in general. Even though information utilization was observed better in the areas of planning and resource allocation and performance monitoring, it was not systematic and still uniform across the board. The quality of data compounded by the limited, limited capacity to support the needed cultural transformation and also the fact that we have been introducing multifaceted digital health interventions have been one of our uh, great challenges as well and creating some delayed implementation at the lower level of the health system. Of course, in, uh, in, our, in our country context, additional challenges are the ICT infrastructure, including electricity, connectivity challenges, which also impact uh, the, how fast our implementation uh, uh, would, we would like it to be. So in our next uh, five year health sector uh, transformation plan, we have clearly articulated the need to continue what we are doing, strengthening that, but also significantly increasing the role of the private sector 
in the provision of overall health services in Ethiopia and strengthening the public-private partnership to strengthen the health system. And we're looking for ways of de for deliberate and systematic collaboration of the government and the private sector to move national health priorities forward beyond individual interventions and programs. And the development and implementation of various digital health tools and services is one area of great potential for the private sector to meaningfully uh, engage in their sector. And we're working on developing such partnerships locally and globally. So I would like to really extend again uh, my appreciation and sincere thanks uh, for the global funds and the whole team for really organizing this uh, timely uh, topic. And I do hope this is for all of us, it's really a time to act. And uh, I'm hoping today we'll hear uh, from the dialogue uh, to show us concrete examples, innovative examples of what can move us uh, also forward from thought into action, especially in the areas of pu public-private partnership in digital health. Because working alongside the private sector, uh, I believe we will go faster in the implementation of uh, digital health solutions to impact health systems in a more sustainable way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, uh, for giving such a um, succinct but also comprehensive view of the progress that's been made in Ethiopia, but also a candid assessment of the challenges and then your description of the uh, future priorities. Um, you mentioned that leadership is one of the critical uh, ingredients for success in making progress in digital health. And, and I think just listening to you, what's clear is that in having somebody like you as Minister of Health, who is so much on top of the detail of all of this and able to grasp the implications and opportunities um, that Ethiopia has the leadership in place. It's, it's enormously impressive. If I can just um, change tack then to, um, what I'd like to do now is introduce um, a short video message from uh, Dr. Raj Shah, Rajiv Shah, who's president of the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, as I mentioned earlier, is in partnership with the Global Fund on this data science catalytic fund. And um, this is not, he wasn't able to attend this session, but I, we wanted to make sure we captured um, some uh, thoughts from him on how data can transform health outcomes. So if we can, if the technology works, can we roll the video? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you, Your Excellency, for those thoughtful remarks. Thank you, Peter, for the invitation to join this important discussion. Since March, everyone here and many others around the world have responded to COVID-19 with everything we've got. The Rockefeller Foundation has been right there with you. In the United States, India, Africa, and Latin America, we are using our expertise and our resources to help high-risk communities access the science and data-based tools, including protective gear, testing and diagnostic technologies, contact tracing, and more, that can help bend the curve of this pandemic until there's a safe, effective, and equitably distributed vaccine. Unfortunately, right now we don't have every tool we need to beat COVID-19, let alone future pandemics. Six years ago, during the Ebola crisis in West Africa, we did not turn the tide on the outbreak until we knew in real time who had the disease and where they lived. Similarly, the world fell far behind the Zika response in Latin America, again, because we could not visualize the trajectory of the outbreak. We know with this latest pandemic that all around the world, months went by before there was any real visibility into who had COVID-19 and where. Without the ability to visualize outbreaks as they are occurring, we simply will not be able to stop them in the future. That's why, even as we work to accelerate the end of COVID-19, we must reimagine that future and leverage the recent revolutions in digital technology and data to improve health security for all. 
Last year, the Rockefeller Foundation has supported the Data Science Catalytic Fund, a partnership with the Global Fund and the governments of Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Burkina Faso. By improving the availability and use of quality data, it aims to improve a public health system's ability to end current epidemics, like tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV-AIDS, as well as pandemic threats like COVID-19. At the Foundation, we're also committing ourselves fully to building a data platform so everyone, not just public health authorities, can visualize in real time the 200 outbreaks that occur each year and threaten to become pandemics. That platform can empower all of us with data and diagnostic tools to confront not only acute crises like outbreaks, but also chronic diseases in areas like maternal health, all of which affect the most vulnerable. At the Foundation, we believe this sort of platform is not just something to imagine, but something to incubate. But we cannot do it alone. We need your help. We want to work with private data and technology firms, as well as those of you in local, state, national, and multilateral institutions, and those from public health authorities, NGOs, and academic institutions. If you want to be involved in this sort of platform, I hope you will get in touch with me or with Dr. Jonathan Quick at the Rockefeller Foundation. Thank you again for the opportunity to join this discussion today. I look forward to working with you in the months and years ahead. Thank you, Raj. As always, extremely clear and succinct. I'd now like to um, broaden the discussion to include the fantastic panel we have with us. And I, I want to start with um, Mike Froman of MasterCard. Uh, Mike, um, inclusive growth is core to MasterCard's strategy, but you're a payments company. Why is digitalizing health um, a priority? And what are you actually doing? Give me, you know, I, I know you're doing things in Rwanda. Can you, can you illuminate a bit about what, what's actually happening? What, what are you making happen? Sure. Well, third, first of all, thank you, Peter, for, for having me and to Concordia for organizing this. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, Apple is not a fruit, Amazon is not a river, and MasterCard is not a credit card company. Uh, we're a technology company that happened to grow up in the payment space. And that's the attitude that we very much take towards inclusive growth and towards global health. Uh, we committed five years ago to bring half a billion people into the financial system. We managed it like any other metric of the company. Um, it's a global program. We achieved it about nine months ahead of time. And in the middle of COVID, we looked around and said, now more than ever, it's important that people are connected to the digital economy, whether it's individuals so that they can get the support they need from from governments and others, uh, or small businesses, micro and small businesses who need to be able to go online and, and engage safely with their customers and their suppliers. And so we doubled down on our commitment to, to inclusion, uh, raised it to a billion people, 50 million micro and small merchants, 25 million uh, women-owned, uh, women-run businesses to focus on bringing them into the, into the, into the, uh, into the digital economy. And COVID also underscored just how much we were at risk for losing, backsliding on a lot of the, the growth and, and development that had happened over the last few years. And so uh, while we have been involved in global health for a while, we focus very much on, on partnering with the Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust uh, to help them set up the uh, therapeutics accelerator and to help bring diagnostics and, and treatments in an equitable basis to low and middle income uh, countries, even while we await the delivery of uh, vaccines. And we brought our technology to the table. We have a, a partnership with Gavi to use our, our network, our technology to help them track the, uh, the, 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 the vaccination of children to make sure that children are getting reminders of the boosters that they need or the next vaccine they need. We're now repurposing that wellness pass platform to be available when there's a COVID vaccine ready to be rolled out in developing countries as well, particularly if it requires more than one dose to make sure that, that, that we're tracking who's getting the doses and when they need to come back for another dose and where governments on an aggregated anonymized basis can help manage their programs. 
It's got to be built on privacy, on individual protection of privacy. But we want to make sure we're using our tools and making them available to the global health sector to try and address these issues. And of course, we're very pleased, uh, Peter, to have a, a partnership with the Global Fund and to be working with you, uh, with Microsoft, with uh, the Rwandan um, uh, Information Society Authority and others to really bring our expertise to the table and help Rwanda develop e electronic health st data standards and guidelines so that they can build an ecosystem with interoperability to be able to see electronic health records across uh, across the system. Uh, something that we can't do alone, but working with uh, the Global Fund, with Microsoft, with the Rwandan authorities, we think there's a real opportunity to help Rwanda securely manage and man uh, manage an interoperable e-health system. And we're working uh, to explore that with Ethiopia as well. And I was, I was delighted to hear the minister's uh, comments earlier about how to bring digital tools to the table in a way that can help community health workers do their jobs uh, better and more efficiently as well. So we're very much committed to this, bringing all of our assets to the table, whether it's our philanthropy, our technology, our products and services, our people very much focused on making sure uh, whatever capabilities we have, we are making available to the, the public sector, to international uh, organizations and, and those dealing with these broad and important global health issues. Thanks, Mike. And I, I, I do want to acknowledge the um, strength and value of the partnership the Global Fund has with MasterCard. I'd like to turn um, to Dr. Seban uh, Nenzimana of the Rwanda Biomedical Center. Uh, Dr. Seban, Mike talked about the work that we've been doing with Rwanda, with Microsoft, with MasterCard on interoperability and on standards. But actually, when you look across the global health sector, this issue of fragmentation of lots of different silos of data and systems is a, is a massive issue um, that gets in the way of scaling things up and gets in the way of aggregate, aggregating and analyzing um, data. Um, wh when you look at this problem from, from your perspective, um, how can governments uh, show leadership here um, how, how can we make this a more integrated, coherent use of technology to support health objectives? But um, thank, thank you, Peter. Um, and thank you, uh, distinguished panelists. And uh, um, so I, I think there are two fundamental issues um, around digital health that um, I, I can quickly mention. Number one is having basic infrastructure uh, required for a, a strong uh, health system that will also accommodate uh, digital health as, as part of the entire uh, system. Uh, and number two, when we talk about digi digital solutions uh, for health, uh, this comes to solve or to respond to an issue, a problem that already exists and not the other way around having uh, systems or solutions, uh, and later on identify a problem to to, to solve. So it, it has, it, it's about the chicken and the egg. So what comes first? Um, so and and to me that is where the issues of fragmentations um, came from. Uh, so we have first to uh, to establish systems, uh, and the systems and strategies goes together. And the project we are working on with uh, MasterCard Foundation, uh, it's, it's all about these uh, systems and guidelines around health uh, information uh, and, and what we need to be able to respond to the needs of, of, of the health sector. And, and number two, uh, we need to be ready for adaptations and, and flexible regulations in, in, in this evolving and highly uh, changing uh, world of pandemics and outbreaks. And technology also changes uh, at different times. So we've seen how um, technology and the health solutions ca can really help to speed up the response to, uh, to diseases and pandemics. And COVID is a good example. But here in Rwanda, we've seen other examples 
uh, like uh, Ebola virus disease that uh, ha has been in, in the region uh, just a year ago and, and still not yet um, out of our borders. Uh, and the technology and the response that has been established uh, were not only responding to current pandemic, but also uh, we've seen this in HIV, in malaria, in tuberculosis, as you earlier mentioned. So the, the experience we've, we've had here in Rwanda is that digital health actually uh, have been widely used here uh, from central to the community levels. Uh, we've had drones and robots being used in COVID, but also in blood delivery, in uh, cancer medicine delivery. Uh, so it doesn't have uh, specific diseases where you need to apply because it can change, can be adapted to any of the response. So we've worked closely with government uh, and, and uh, private sectors, society organizations, and different partners uh, to deploy these solutions uh, around one national strategy. This is, uh, to me, as you said, the, the, the fundamental element here is having a national strategy and having uh, tools and uh, guidelines in place ahead of any deployment, any testing, or any um, uh, solutions that uh, would come otherwise, as you said, you'll be having um, these silos and efficiencies uh, if there's no alignment uh, ahead of time. So in, in brief, I think um, digital uh, health technologies are inevitable in responding to pandemics. And that is a fact we've seen it for COVID, and COVID actually has helped us to speed up some of these and the strategic to use of uh, digital health is is, is, is key. Uh, otherwise, you have the burden of maintaining all these uh, solutions if they're not initially uh, planned for uh, for a reason. And uh, as you clearly said, we are all looking for a vaccine um, that will be easily deployed. And uh, thinking of our context in Africa and how uh, these vaccines that we require extra cold chain, chain, chain uh, uh, rooms and uh, logistics. Uh, we, we were already thinking on how technology and digital solutions can be helpful uh, in deployment of these vaccines in collecting data in real time uh, on side effects, adverse events of these vaccines. So this is an example on how currently we need uh, digital health solutions more than before uh, as we uh, almost get to uh, the vaccine that, uh, as you said, uh, has been developed in uh, record time. Uh, we never seen this this in the history, or, uh, and this is fantastic. But again, the how we deploy it and how we invest in it right ahead uh, matters uh, the most. So I really want to thank you and all the organizers, Global Fund, Mastercard Foundation, uh, and and all the colleagues that uh, are on this on this platform. Uh, this is an interesting conversation in Rwanda. Uh, is uh, looking forward to continue invest in digital health uh, to save lives and to be efficient uh, as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sensimana. And uh, I think you, um, you made a very good point about one of the issues in this arena. Um, you talked about chicken and eggs. I think of um, hammers and nails. There's a lot of people with hammers going around trying to work out which nail they should hit rather than focusing on a national strategy that has already been developed and then saying, how do we help make uh, this happen? Can I um, turn to uh, Nanjiri Sambuli of um, Transform Health? Um, civil society um, sometimes I think has a, a love-hate relationship with um, technology. Um, early on in the crisis, many of the community groups that Global Fund works with struggled to adapt quickly to um, the remote environment, the virtual environment required by lockdowns for the simple reason they didn't have the technology, the kit. Um, and also in many of them, the experience of having this kind of digital uh, interaction. Actually, Microsoft um, uh, was incredibly helpful in helping uh, provide teams um, access for many of our civil society partners um, and people have adapted pretty quickly. But also there are issues around data privacy, uh, particularly for 
uh, marginalized or um, stigmatized key populations. Um, and, and so there have been some concerns, but how do we turn that to the positive? And um, how, how do we make sure that the gains in digital health are not a threat, but a, a way of empowering and improving equitable access for the most vulnerable populations? Nanjira. Thank you, Peter. And maybe I should qualify and say it's mostly critical love. <laughs> that is exists, sometimes you need that critical angle. Well, I'll speak to this from the perspective of Transform Health that is trying to um, also advance this discourse. And Transform Health is a, a coalition of organizations dedicated to achieving health for all in the digital age by leveraging the effective, equitable and ethical deployment of digital technology and data to strengthen health systems. All this is with the aim to expand primary health care and ensure universal health coverage by 2030. And so we welcome the technical expertise that the tech sector um, is, is bringing and that is instrumental to this vision. That said, and this is where our civil society perspective is critical, is that technology is not solely the, or the only fix. We already know that the envisioned digital transformation in health is limited by weak health and ICT systems across many countries, as we've also heard. Now, addressing and closing digital divides is an absolutely important prerequisite for digital health futures. So at Transform Health, we believe that the involvement of key communities, such as young people, women, and marginalized groups, in the design, use, and governance of digital technologies and data is paramount to closing these divides and attaining uh, equity, including in the health sector. And here's where it becomes interesting. This absolutely has to be mainstreamed and not be treated as an afterthought or the, the voice of civil society. We absolutely need everyone, including technology companies, to center this. As emerging technologies find use cases in the health sector, it is imperative that they're not deployed with uh, deterministic assumptions or solutionistic fervor. Uh, nor are they, should they be conceptualized for health transformation through a narrow lens that prioritizes some region's perspectives over others. As such, um, the collaboration with individuals, communities, governments, and institutions that are most affected by the lack of access to equitable, affordable, and high quality healthcare is a cornerstone of the Transform Health Coalition. Now, along with the promise of digital technologies transforming health systems, we must remember that technologies per se are not a panacea. They can enhance, but should not replace traditional health service delivery models, nor substitute human interaction in healthcare delivery. Now we've seen this, uh, the hype versus the minimal impact of what were COVID-19 tra uh, tracking slash notification apps, for example. And there's a lesson there to draw as we, as we march forward towards digital uh, advancing in the healthcare sy system. Now, the notion of digital disruption does need to be assessed with a critical lens and even with caution because health is such a core socioeconomic pillar and the complexities of diverse contexts must be factored in. It's very important, for example, to acknowledge that what might work in a developed country is not necessarily transferable to a developing one or even what works in Ethiopia might not necessarily work here in Kenya. Um, each country has its own dimensions that must be factored in as we design systems. Uh, likewise, what works in urban areas may not work in rural areas. So essentially, any digital universalism uh, where we, are, we want to scale every, everything that works in one context is a seductive but can be a very reductionist approach to digital transformation that we need to identify and mitigate accordingly. We already see that access to uh, and affordability to both digital and health in many countries is highly unequal. And so we must ensure that in digitize, uh, digitalizing healthcare, we do not widen and create new inequalities. And relatedly, the tech sector must learn from and work with healthcare practitioners and civil society actors in every system they permeate and in every community they want to serve to establish the most appropriate ways to introduce and sustain digitalization in respective health sectors. So in sum, Transform Health's vision is that uni uh, universal healthcare will be achieved by 2030 by indeed harnessing digital technology and the use of data so that everyone has access to equitable, affordable, high quality primary healthcare, that everyone is able to make better decisions about their personal health using real time health information and their own protected health data, that everyone is aware of and able to exercise their rights to own and access their own data to improve their own health, that healthcare workers are equipped 
to improve efficiency and capacity of health systems to ensure better public and individual health outcomes, and that researchers are able to access and use health data for research purposes that will improve public health. So we must just all agree on how we're going to do that. Brilliant, thank you. And I love the notion of, of critical love. I think that's a great concept. Um, can I turn to you, Elizabeth Merubadang? Um, Orange obviously is absolutely at the front line of how we leverage the connectivity of mobiles and mobile technology for mobile health. Um, I know you've been doing some um, great things in Morocco, but I'd be interested in hearing, I think, uh, more about that and also more generally your observations for the opportunity to extend and you leverage mobile technology for health across Africa. Thank you, Peter. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm really delighted to take part in this panel, uh, which shows, listening to the, the different panelists who have uh, already spoken on how uh, Technology have the potential to clearly transform a uh, healthcare system in, in Africa. A few words uh, about Orange for those who don't know. We operate in 18 countries in Africa and, and Middle East. And we strongly believe at Orange that uh, technology in Africa more than, more than anywhere else is one of the main uh, lever to improve access to essential services. And uh, health services are uh, among those. And for us, is one of our priority to, to leverage on the technology in order to improve access to those essential services. So health is one of them, but also education and, and, and others. To do that, uh, the main bricks on which, on which we build our involvement is connectivity you, you have mentioned, but many of you have mentioned that uh, we strive to increase the coverage uh, everywhere where we operate. Today, uh, we have a coverage of more than 80% of the population in all the countries in average where, where we operate in our footprint. Uh, we consider that uh, the digital divide that have been mentioned uh, could be even uh, could even enlarge the inequalities if we were not uh, making sure to embark everyone on board. And we think that mobile uh, is one of the technology which could, when you consider the infrastructure challenges that we have we have in Africa is one of the technology which will the most efficiently improve the reachability of people. But as Na Na Nanija was saying, uh, all the countries are very specific. We are talking about health, which is a very serious matter, and we are not specialized in, in health. So our approach is based on building uh, relevant partnerships between different stakeholders, be it public uh, stakeholders, private company, uh, multilateral uh, organization, uh, health services, like, like what we do with the Global Fund. And we are really um, pleased to be part of this uh, conversation. We think our approach around that, it's really, we consider that uh, the solution that the, our value proposition should be tailored to the needs of our stakeholders. We don't come and bring our solution. We listen to the, the, our customers, we listen to our partners and try to understand what the issues are and how we can leverage of the different technology to try to address the issues. Some of the issues like uh, keeping the patient in contact with, with uh, the doctors, they don't require very sophisticated uh, technology. Sometimes short messages are enough to do that. So we build our solution around three main areas. 
One of them is uh, provide uh, health professional or authorities with uh, some specific services like data collection, like uh, hosting, like uh, service. But we also have another area of services related to patient, remote monitoring, uh, diagnosis prevention. And, and uh, uh, we build our value proposition around these three uh, kind of services. So in Morocco, just to mention an example, uh, we work in partnership with Global Fund and the Ministry of uh, Health. So we interconnect all the, the stations, all the, the uh, let's say, locations. We have dedicated a specific solution to help to manage uh, appointments with doctors and notification from the doctor to the patient. So it's an app uh, that can be customized for customers to get uh, reminders when they have uh, an appointment, the location of the doctor, the specific requirement that the doctor may need for uh, this uh, specific uh, appointment. So this is uh, been rolling out as, as we speak today. It's just an example to show that each solution is specific. If I mention Cote d'Ivoire, it's another, another solution, another platform, but the, the, the objective being to understand the need to leverage of technology. Sometimes it could be data, sometimes it could be just short messages, sometimes it could be internet connection. So we bundle all these services leveraging on the knowledge, the specific knowledge uh, from uh, health uh, practitioners and partner, partners such as uh, Global Fund or, or Gavi. So we are committed to continue to, to, to participate in such partnerships. The challenge being how to scale it, how to get more and more authorities involved, how to manage the, 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 the the, the, the behavioral change, because there is a need for education, a need for behavioral change, a need for communication. So we are really committed and, and very excited to be part of this uh, critical conversation. Thank, Thank you. you, Elizabeth. And a couple of reflections. One is, it's clear that the approach you're taking is very much in the spirit of uh, what uh, what Dr. Uh, Enzamina was saying was necessary, which is um, rather than going with the solution is being listening and understanding the needs first and trying to work out how you can um, uh, help. And I noticed also your emphasis on the, the behavioral changes, which brings us back to something the minister was talking about right at the beginning, which is it's only partly a technical problem um, it's often the way people use and interact with the technology that is um, vital. Can I um, uh, move on to uh, Dr. Uma of the Africa CDC? Uh, when you look at it, actually, um, Africa's response to the COVID crisis has, has been remarkable. Um, extraordinary amount of leadership, um, swiftness of action, and cross-border cooperation. And I know that the uh, Africa CDC team under John Ekengasson has played an absolutely um, critical role in achieving that level of speed, coordination, and coherence of um, response. When you look forward and consider the challenges of the next phase of the response and looking beyond COVID to sort of broader health agenda um, in Africa. What do you see as the role of technology in helping Africa as a whole and specifically Africa CDC uh, de deliver on its mission? Um, uh, thanks, Peter. And um, um, it's really good to see uh, an eminent panel like this uh, to discuss some of these key issues on the uh, issues around global digital health. Um, and thanks to Global Fund for pulling this uh, together during these very difficult times to be able to meet and, uh, and uh, discuss. Um, at Africa CDC, um, we see a few challenges looking into the future. 
Um, this has been a very unique time because in a pandemic, everyone is locked down. And um, really, um, we are all suffering the same, uh, more or less the same um, discomforts of sitting home and probably not being able to work as usual. Um, many times, um, in the majority of the times, uh, in outbreak situations, it's usually within a locality, within a country, or within just a few countries. And the rest of the world continues with uh, uh, what they do um, uh, in, a, in their normal way. So looking into the future, uh, the first challenge I see is being able to keep the kind of attention that we have kept of our leaders, of our policymakers, of those with the deep pockets of the public. Um, on an issue uh, so that we can be able to discuss it, uh, understand it, and respond to it in an appropriate way. And I think in Africa, um, this we have done uh, quite effectively. The numbers of, uh, we've kept them low. Um, the, the amount of heart and, um, you know, mobility, mortality has also been low. Um, but um, this is only when you compare yourself with someone else who's uh, 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 faring uh, a lot uh, worse. So in an outbreak situation where it's only a small area of the world that is involved, the kind of attention we are getting now we'll not be able to get. Um, and so we must really be able to utilize this opportunity uh, to unpack all the issues effectively uh, so that we get solutions that will last beyond uh, uh, this pandemic. Second challenge that I see is um, being able to generate enough interest in digital tools uh, to get into the health uh, space. Um, today, um, we are seeing uh, disease intelligence being easier because there are digital tools out there and simply because it is um, uh, COVID and it's a pandemic. So we have a lot of people involved in ensuring that we are getting digital tools in place. Um, we don't know what will happen tomorrow. And when we look at the situation currently, the sharing of data uh, is a bit of an issue and not just uh, within um, uh, neighbors, uh, for example, in Africa, but also globally. Although we are seeing data um, uh, being shared, it is the road, uh, the, the basic, very high level data, how many are infected, how many have unfortunately passed away, how many have recovered, but not the detailed data that you need for preparation for uh, the next uh, uh, stage. So um, um, being able to get tools for disease intelligence is a challenge that we see in a situation where we don't have a pandemic and people's interests have shifted uh, to somewhere else. Um, the third thing is um, um, we have uh, sort of um, all been on Zoom or uh, Microsoft Teams or whichever platform we use for, uh, for these meetings so much that uh, I don't know how we'll shift back to physical meetings. Um, but um, I guess we'll have to. So the third challenge I see is being able to get uh, good tools that can be able to allow us to have capacity building going on in a smooth way, uh, much more smooth than it was before this uh, particular pandemic. Um, and um, uh, whether our technology uh, colleagues will be able to develop those and make them available. Uh, in an easier in an easier fashion, uh, this um, is 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 going to be extremely important so that we are able to catch um, um, outbreaks very early and we are able to prepare for them very early and we are able to bring them under control also relatively quickly. And I'm happy to uh, to also share that we are just two one or two days away uh, from declaring the Ebola uh, outbreak, the eleventh one in DRC on the western side. Uh, um, uh, you know, over uh, simply because um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, partnerships had been uh, uh, brought into that, including using technology to, we, we never went to DRC this time, we did everything online. And so those tools of being able to uh, build capacity, being able to pass information, being able to share, um, if those uh, can actually be able to be built to be streamlined for proper training and not just meetings, uh, that will be uh, extremely useful. But I see that uh, as a challenge. Finally, is uh, the messaging, the messaging particularly to uh, members of the public. Um, right now, a lot of the uh, tools for messaging that are being developed are very, very much based on um, um, uh, smartphones. Uh, and in Africa, um, a very good chunk of the population do not use smartphones. Um, they use um, our usual 
um, really SMS-based uh, messaging services. So there is the challenge of trying to ensure that we can be able to use all platforms, all types of platforms to be able to communicate with members of the public and provide the correct inf information in a timely manner uh, so that we do not wait um, uh, for um, uh, you know, radio, television, internet, which may not be as accessible in all parts. But the mobile phone, the SMS service, it is always there wherever you find human beings uh, on, or, or in, the, uh, in the world. So utilizing um, um, the all platforms is going to be extremely important and uh, we need to encourage our IT colleagues to uh, develop um, uh, I, uh, tools that can be able to be used in the non-smartphone um, uh, uh, platforms as well. And I think the final challenge that I see is the ability for us to continue to work collaboratively across um, um, the, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the disciplines, across the sectors. We have done that very well during this pandemic because uh, we, we had to, or all of us were affected one way or the other. But then can we be able to bring on board IT colleagues tomorrow when it is only monkeypox in uh, Cameroon uh, or somewhere like that? Can we be able to bring to bear um, our lawyers um, uh, if um, it is only um, a Lassa fever somewhere in Nigeria? So we need to start strengthening the bonds that we have created um, around these digital platforms that we are meeting so that all the sectors, all the um, uh, experts uh, can actually be able uh, to stay on cause and contribute to the next outbreak that will come. And uh, just to share that in Africa today, we have 15 outbreaks going on at the same time as COVID as number 16. But of course, we only talk about COVID, unfortunately. So uh, the ability to work across sector and bring everybody together is another challenge that we see. But the lessons that we have learned, um, these challenges we are at Africa CDC, we are turning them into opportunities and we want to be able to work uh, extremely um, effectively across sectors, uh, across disciplines, and utilizing all the digital platforms that we can be able to utilize and tools uh, to deliver a more secure Africa. I thank you for the opportunity, uh, Peter. Thank you, Ahmed, and the really thoughtful and interesting insights um, you, you shared. Um, I very much um, uh, resonate um, with the uh, last point about can we keep this spirit of collaboration uh an awful lot of energy is wasted in global health with frictions and overlaps and duplications and suddenly during covid19 we've discovered how to get away with all that and how to actually work together more effectively and like you i worry that that we will lose that spirit um once the immediate crisis um, and that would be a tragedy if we do so. Um, we need to keep that uh, spirit of intense collaboration. Greg Moore um, at Microsoft. Microsoft has been a, a, a pioneer in digital health transformation for many years, and you're a great partner of the Global Fund. When you step back and you reflect on all the things that have been said by the other panelists, um, and you think about what are the big opportunities for digital transformation? What is it, what really excites you? And what do you think it really takes to make it happen? Well, well thank you, Peter. And uh, it's a privilege to participate in this uh, discussion with uh, this distinguished group of panelists. And, uh, you know, at Microsoft, our, our our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And, and you know, that's particularly tr true in the area of digital health and health transformation. Um, and this couldn't be a more critical time for us um, uh, to partner um, with the Global Fund and, and your partners um, uh, to achieve this mission and, and true transformation. You know what? It, what excites me to your question, Peter, is is you know this this opportunity to to enable healthcare workers, um, um, uh, patients to uh, seamlessly access their data um, and uh, to for use of diagnostics, for use of 
decision making um, and to truly share their information. Um, as you as you pointed out at, at the beginning, um, right now information doesn't flow. It's it's locked in silos, whether that's in healthcare institutions um, or other um, organizations, and can't be used um, to um, help with the next vaccine or develop the next best diagnostic, um, and uh, or to help any of us live our lives better or, or promote healthier lives across populations. Um, so what excites me is a radically interoperable data system and to be able to do that with um, um, connected cloud ecosystems and, and to really make it incredibly easy for providers, um, for public health entities and even patients to, to have access and to share that information. It's, it's, it's so critical. And to me, it's, it's exciting to see the work of the Global Fund making investments in this area, MasterCard and others. Um, um, you know, towards this radical interoperability that provides, a, uh, provides for um, enterprise-grade security, um, privacy of, of the flow of this, of this information and, and, and to develop these digital health architectures that are, that are, are sophisticated and now can be rapidly deployed. And, and it's, it, to me, um, one of the fantastic parts of this call is to see, you know, um, governments like Ethiopia and Rwanda making investments to actually lead the way um, uh, for uh, this, this interoperable uh, data flow to allow um, really important things to happen, to spot disease early, and then to provide the right interve intervention at the right time to the right patient, um, um, to even uh, go further upstream you know, from, uh, from responding to uh, pandemics um, that, that uh, um, are, have, have, we're seeing such unfortunate effects to so actually um, pushing upstream to um, helping individuals live healthier lives and even prevention. You know, the second opportunity that I'm excited about um, here beyond that is, is how we can use technology to provide training and, and information to, to uh, healthcare workers at the front lines um, to deliver quality care, to actually enable them to meet um, their patients um, um, where they're at um, and, and telehealth and, and now the implementation of, of AI can help um, do that. We're seeing that through virtual platforms like the one we're using today and Teams and, and others. Um, the vision there that excites me is for, for example, telehealth to provide remote diagnostic sensing um, um, and even monitoring capabilities um, um, that we see in the world. And, I think the opportunity here is is to is to ensure that um, um, as we as we develop this technology, we do so in a way that's enabling both low and middle income countries to become actually the hubs of healthcare innovation, and we're seeing that now um, um, already. And 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 there's actually a distinct advantage um, in in working in countries that actually don't have a a legacy um, infrastructure of healthcare. Um, and it enables this, this rapid change. When, when you put catalysts for innovations there, you can often move much more rapidly without being encumbered by legacy systems going forward. And that, and that um, enables the potential for really large scale rapid um, change in the healthcare ecosystem. Um, you know, in the near term, this means, um, as my colleague, as Mike at MasterCard, uh, um, talked about and other panelists was, was really connecting um, and the potential to connect literally billions of, of, of people across ecosystems to allow this um, 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 flow of, of data across the healthcare ecosystems. That'll initially occur with uh, both uh, with both private and, and, and public partnerships and, and philanthropy. So key here to, 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 start to begin um, this ecosystem, allowing it to thrive and then creating a sustainable ecosystem as we go forward. And, and it won't be a one-way exchange. Best practices that we see um, that are rapidly innovated will actually flow um, um, from uh, low and middle income um, countries actually um, to other parts of the world and back and really set up this virtuous circle of innovation. So um, incredibly excited um, about um, the potential I'm seeing what's already happening. And, and you mentioned, Peter, um, risks here. <laughs> you know, what are the risks for us not happening? And I'll just quickly, quickly to summarize there, say, I think the greatest 
you know, so we have great potential here and we're already investing. The greatest risk that we have is actually inaction. Um, and uh, to all of this, uh, we simply can't wait with what's at stake for the next pandemic to d d drive a nonlinear innovation uh, in pace. We, we really um, need to take action and it's really great to see this set of panelists uh, really engage in this today. Um, and I look forward to working with you all to, uh, to really drive this transformation at the, with the pace of urgency that it needs. Fantastic, Greg. And as you say, we uh, we used to talk about the cycle of uh, of panic and neglect that characterized the world's approach to pandemics. We don't want to lurch back into uh, neglect um, as soon as this we feel like we've got on top of COVID. Um, I I I wanted to take the opportunity actually to very quickly. Um, revert back to uh, Minister Tedese um, uh, to just get any quick reflections that you have. You're in the hot seat actually having to make all this happen for the benefit of your um, citizens. So any quick reflections on um, the things that the other panelists have been saying? And just, just so you know, we, apparently we've been given an extra five minutes, so you've got a couple of minutes. <laughs> The opportunity there and uh, truly it was really uh, wonderful to hear all the great insights from this distinguished panel uh, on this uh, critical topic. It's really clear to see from all the discussions uh, the, the critical role digital health can play in really advancing uh, the, and solving the different challenges of the health sector, especially uh, in terms of creating a responsive uh, health system to the communities that can really empower them when we talk about uh, mobile health uh, that can really help communities really take care of their own health. And also within uh, the, the uh, facilities, the role of digital health, how, how it can really empower also health workers to make better clinical decisions, but also uh, uh, facilities to make better decisions based on their data because the use of data does not just, uh, should not be limited to policy making and strategies only, but at every facility level, organizational level, even department level, this easily accessible data can really transform the uh, quality of care that's being delivered. And uh, also at uh, government level, national level, how the, the impact that it can bring in uh, really digitizing this health information system uh, in terms of uh, better decision making and better response to emergencies. We can we have clearly seen all the experiences that has been shared. Uh, and also, of course, those easily available data are what would translate into research that can give us the needed evidence for all the different innovations that are needed. And uh, what was also raised about really looking into context of each country, I think is also critical. Uh, I mean, uh, we are fortunately in, in uh, uh, a world that's really interconnected uh, now. And uh, although we are, all the countries have different stages, um, different s development uh, or economic status, but uh, the access to digital technology can be something that can uh, really, uh, does not have to take the time that is needed for other uh, development and that the leap can be taken to advance the different uh, um, um, the, the health system in many countries, despite the economic uh, challenge that we have. And uh, I think what was uh, especially uh, at the end that um, mentioned was about inaction, I think is really something um, I really concur with. Uh, we're now looking into an interaction review of our COVID response to look, because we don't want to wait until we, the pandemic is over to really review what's working uh, what's not working and what what can we scale uh, from the response, the COVID uh, response. Uh, so we are doing an extensive interaction review, which is not just limited to the health sector because the response has been a multi-sectoral effort that uh, uh, we have to also institutionalize and uh, make it as a, a system based. So uh, one of the key pillars we are looking at is the data and uh, digital health in terms of advancing also this emergency preparedness response. So I think the 
continuously taking action, what uh, is, is also uh, a really uh, bold uh, emphasis uh, um, uh, message that was given. And that this lastly, because most of you emphasize the issue of interoperability, which I think is also uh, uh, concur, it's very critical in terms of uh, advancing what we want, because one of our biggest challenges has been we work with different partners with different systems, which at the end are not interoperable and uh, do not give us the needed outcome, actually may sometimes be uh, more cumbersome and challenging. So investing in ensuring interoperability in uh, country systems, I think is really a critical pillar as we think of the next um, steps we need to take in uh, advancing digital health. So uh, with this, I think I would like to end and really thank uh, the, it was a really excellent insight that was shared by all panelists. Thank you so much, Vita. Thank you, Minister. And um, just to close, I'm not going to attempt to summarize what was a very rich and inspiring uh, discussion. I just want to thank Your Excellency, the Minister of Health for Ethiopia, Dr. Via Tedesi, Mike Froman of MasterCard, Dr. Sabin um, Sensimana of the Rwanda Biomedical Center, and Jiri Sambuli of Transform Health, Elizabeth Medu Bedang of Orange. Dr. Ahmed Uma of the Africa CDC and Dr. Greg Moore of Microsoft. Thank you all of you for A, the partnership, B, what you're doing to transform people's lives and C, for your inspiring and perceptive and interesting remarks and conversation today. Thank you all very much. <laughs>